Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Erin Deere, a faculty member at Osgoode Hall Law School. Professor Deere is currently at Yale as the Canadian Bicentennial Visiting Professor of Law at Yale Law School and a Global Justice Senior Fellow at the Macmillan Center. His research interests include corporate law, governance, and theory and the intersections of transnational business activity with international human rights norms. Today we talk with Professor Deere about his forthcoming book under contract with Cambridge University Press titled Challenging Boardroom Homogeneity, Corporate Law, Governance, and Diversity. Welcome, Professor Deere. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about the book. Give us an overview. Yeah, so the book is essentially about a core location of power in the global marketplace, and that's the corporate boardroom. Okay. And it looks at the boardroom through the lens of sociodemographic composition. Mm -hmm. So what are the groups that have been permitted access to the highest levels of the corporate hierarchy, and what groups have been excluded? So for example, are you on social media? Yes. Okay. So if we think back to Facebook's IPO, that was in 2012, mm -hmm. and then Twitter's IPO uh, just last November. Um, with both of those IPOs, the firms received scathing criticism because they went public with all-white, all-male corporate boards. Mm -hmm. And so just staying with gender for a second, if we look at the global statistics, they definitely indicate that women are underrepresented in corporate boardrooms, in senior management positions, etc. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about this issue, I'm primarily concerned in the book with legal regulation. There's been a really interesting trend over the last few years where states, seeing the homogeneity in their corporate boards, have turned to law um, as a means of attempting, at least, to diversify the corporate boardroom. And so we see this in generally one of two ways. Uh, the first way is the quota-based approach. Mm -hmm. So a number of states have enacted corporate quotas for the boardroom. Um, and in their strongest form, they essentially obligate companies to have a certain level of gender balance mm -hmm. on the board. And then the second primary way is through disclosure. So that's a much softer approach. The idea is not that we'll mandate a certain outcome, but that we'll get companies to publicly report on diversity-related governance information. Mm -hmm. The theory being that if you get them to sort of bring this to the front of mind and then publicly report that something about that will cause behavioral modification. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now are we talking the United States only or globally? So I'm looking at this globally okay. um, and I've taken on essentially two case studies. So my case study for the quota-based approach is Norway, mm -hmm. and my case study for the disclosure-based approach is the US. Interesting. I would have thought the Scandinavian countries, or I've always assumed anyway, are much better at having more of a gender balance. Is that true or no? Yeah, it is true. And I think what sort of struck people in a place like Norway was that women were represented in many other policy spheres, mm -hmm. but that the corporation was the outlier. Mm -hmm. And surprised by that, um, the government wanted to move forward with ameliorative measures. Very good. Um, as a woman, <laughs> I say, yay. Um, what led you to write the book? What was the impetus? Right. Well. Most of my work over the last few years has actually focused on corporate ac accountability issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, transnational corporations operating in the global south that are allegedly complicit in human rights violations. And in working in that particular policy space, I've just consistently been struck by the fact that corporate board members, senior executives, tend to be of a certain demographic. Mm -hmm. And that just led me to think about, would the corporation's relationship with the environment, or labor, or human rights be any different if primary decision makers weren't so uniform a group, if mm -hmm. the group was a bit more diverse? Right, right. And so in terms of your methodology, how are you um, how are you doing this? I mean, have you identified certain companies within the United States and certain companies within Europe? Talk about that a bit. Right. So it's a mixed methods approach. Uh, so getting back to the quota approach, 
for Norway, um, Norway was the first country, as I've mentioned, to pursue the quota. Mm -hmm. And so let's say you're a Norwegian company and you have a board that has nine members. Um, under Norwegian corporate law, 40% of each gender must be represented in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. And if not, actually, any guesses as to what happens if not? <laughs> <laughs> it gets to be a woman. So in some countries, <laughs> if not, the next appointment must be a woman. Okay. Yeah, some countries have that approach. In Norway, if you don't meet the desired level of representation, the state will just step in and forcibly dissolve your company. Wow. It's incredible. How, how awesome is that? Quite the incentive, huh? It is quite the incentive. <laughs> and so when the law passed, um, there was very quickly 100% compliance for that reason. So, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm just shocked also by uh, rules in this country and then rules in Norway that the laws actually get passed because I would imagine that thousands and millions of dollars would just be thrown at not allowing that to happen. Yeah, so time and time again I heard <coughs> if you want to get this done you need extreme measures, that's the only mm -hmm. way it will happen. So with Norway, I, so I traveled to Oslo and I did qualitative interview based research. Mm -hmm. I interviewed a number of Norwegian directors about their experience with the quota law and the idea there is to understand how does mandated diversity inhabit their everyday economic and institutional lives. Mm -hmm. um, so then, and then on the disclosure approach, um, what I've done is um, in 2010, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the regulatory body overseeing uh, the issuance of shares and, and the public markets, mm -hmm. it passed a, a law saying that companies have to report on whether diversity informs their director nomination process, and if so, how. Mm -hmm. So I've assembled, I've taken a sample of the S&P 100, and I've assembled their corporate reports for the first four years of the law, mm -hmm. and I'm analyzing the discourse. Mm -hmm. How is this idea of diversity discursively performed in their corporate reports? And so what are, what are you finding? Yeah, so the findings are interesting. <laughs> On the quota front, much of the policy discussion internationally on quotas is very negative. Mm -hmm. The feeling being that quotas will serve to uh, stigmatize the intended beneficiary, um, that people who come into the boardroom as a result of a quota won't be sort of well integrated, mm -hmm. that they'll be marginalized, that and they'll be And I was going to ask you about that. So. Yeah, and so I asked all of my interviewees that mm -hmm. question. And I was very surprised it was barely an issue. Really? Yeah. So they were embraced by the rest of the board, despite being a woman. I was very surprised. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, what do they think accounts for this? And it's interesting. I think for most of these directors, their view was they're absolutely qualified to be in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. It's just that there were systemic barriers preventing their access. So of course they should be there. Mm -hmm. And it also seems to be that the design of the Norwegian law facilitates a critical mass of representation. Mm -hmm. So you can marginalize one or two directors, but if it's 40% of the board, how can you realistically True. do that? Right, right. And then my finding on the disclosure front is interesting too, because when the SEC designed this law, this rule, it decided not to define diversity. It thought, you know what, let's let corporations report on diversity however it makes sense to them <coughs> within the context of their specific business operations. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, diversity then could mean um, a Hispanic man versus a woman. Is it that could, okay. but what's interesting is that firms only talk about diversity in socio-demographic terms, mm -hmm. so gender or race, about half of the time. Half of the time and most predominantly they talk about diversity vis-a-vis -vis experiential factors, mm -hmm. the backgrounds of their directors, et cetera. Uh-huh. So that's not really helping the cause, though, I would imagine, in terms of getting more women. That's the right? argument. So is that, is that what's happening? Yeah. That, that because of the vagueness, really, of the law, that that's their, it's a loophole, basically. It's interesting because the SEC has said that their official position is that they were not trying to uh, mandate conduct or steer behavior. Mm -hmm. But when you look at 
the responses of market to participants when it first uh, proposed the rule, they clearly wanted information on factors like gender and race. Mm -hmm. So the sort of common understanding is that this was about diversification in those areas, even if that's not the official position, mm -hmm. but that's not what's happened which is really interesting. So do you think anything will happen now because of that? So th that will be well, uh, part of my recommendations in the book will be that although disclosure is a favored regulatory tool in the US, mm -hmm. in this case, you know, the devil's in the details. So in this case, it was a gentle nudge, mm -hmm. but what's really needed is a bit of a harder shove. Right, right. So in terms of the corporations, and I imagine there are some in, in the United States that are hiring women based on that law, or um, versus when you look at what happened in Norway, um, are the women who are hired here, did you look at how the women, did you interview any women hired here in terms of how they are being received? Right, no. Okay. So my qualitative research, the interview-based research, uh, was focused on Norway. Mm -hmm. So it's a content analysis okay. I'm doing for right, the US. Right, right. And also, because the law was only passed in 2010, it's very early, right. so it's hard to know the effects. Mm -hmm. But I think going forward, doing interviews with uh, female corporate directors in the US, for example, will be a great follow-up right. study. So in, in the course of doing your research, was there anything that struck you as odd or surprising? Yeah, Something so... Something you didn't expect? I, I think both of those things that I just mentioned. Okay. The fact that quotas are not sort of seem to be, uh, the effect of them is not seen to be marginalization, mm -hmm. but rather of democratized access. And the fact that diversity discourse under the US rule tends to be more about experiential factors and background mm -hmm. rather than about gender and race. Right. So moving forward, um, you know, what do you think uh, the trend will be, both in Norway and here? Yeah, in the it's, United States. it's interesting. Uh, Norway, the law was very, very controversial. Oh. But I have the sense that things have settled down now. Mm -hmm. And it'll be, since that time, it's really interesting because uh, subsequently countries like uh, Italy, Iceland, Belgium, France have all followed suit and passed quota-based measures. Mm -hmm. So whether that spreads even further, it'll be interesting to watch, to, to watch right, for right. and see. And then in the US, I'm going to recommend in this book that the SEC take uh, another look at this rule and design it with a bit more of a forceful shove. Mm -hmm. um, and the underlying argument will be that because the norms of diversity haven't infiltrated the boardroom yet, that just getting companies to talk about it it might be a helpful first step, but it's limited in its utility. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the, the main reason for not being more accepting of women at that level? I don't think it's an issue of, most of the time, I don't think it's an issue of explicit discrimination. I think a lot of the time it's implicit cognitive bias, mm -hmm. um, certain assumptions that we hold about who should uh, take on leadership positions, and it's also about closed social networks. Okay. At the end of the day, people are tapped for corporate boardroom positions through their networks, right. through the existing networks of directors. Who do they know? Mm -hmm. And so time after time, the Norwegian directors told me that one of the real benefits of the law is that it forces boards to go outside of traditional mm -hmm. networks to other spaces. Right, right. And I think that, I think that really helps a company grow bringing you know new ideas and new people in so I think it would behoove us in this country to do the same thing also um, one, uh, one last question geographically in the United States do you notice a big difference in corporate makeup for instance perhaps more women in the Northeast versus the South that yeah. kind of thing I haven't actually studied okay. that aspect but I think I think you're right as a follow-up study that would be really mm -hmm. interesting too I have thought about it a little bit just in terms of industry so in certain industries Industries, you see better representation than others. Um, the extractive sector, for example, mm -hmm. mining metals, oil and gas, tends to be pretty bad. 
Um, and the argument they'll make is that well, they don't have women coming up through the pipeline right. in those industries. Right, yeah, that makes sense. So when will your book be out? Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's uh, under contract with Cambridge mm -hmm. University Press, and the manuscript should be off to them within a matter of weeks, and then it'll go through the produc production right. cycle and very soon. Okay, well, congratulations on that. Thank you. And thank you very much for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. For more information about Professor Deere and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.